Good evening, everyone. I am uh, Pastor Ed, and for Trinity Lutheran Church in San Rafael, we're having another evening of Bible study called Coffee with Kruger. And as usual, I'm having my cup of coffee right here. A little bit of milk instead, I think, tonight. I don't know about you, but I what what I do for a coffee is a cup co a coffee in the morning, and that's about it. But I know some of you drink coffee all day, right? Not One me. cup in the morning. Mine's in the morning. I thought that this week for our session tonight, we would look at the life of Jesus during the final week between Palm Sunday and his res resurrection on, on Easter. And so I put together some uh, PowerPoint slides to kind of walk us through that and what took place during that week. And so we'll talk about it and have some questions over it and uh, see where it leads us. But let's open up uh, with a word of prayer, okay? okay? Heavenly Father, we come before you this evening so thankful for the fact that you have uh, enfolded us in your arms, <laughs> that you love us unconditionally, and that we have the certainty of life eternal with you because of the death and resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray tonight, Lord, we might be enlightened by our study and grow in faith and our eagerness to witness uh, these wonderful truths in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So let me share the screen. You see a little PowerPoint there? Yes. So the very first thing that we want to do is take a look at uh, Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday being the Sunday, this coming Sunday, actually, we'll be celebrating it. Uh, it, it was the day when uh, Jesus um, begins his trip to Jerusalem. Uh, he already had indicated to his disciples many times that he needed to go to Jerusalem and there to die and in three days uh, rise again. And so he was nearing the, the city, a small town called Bethphage, Bethphage and Bethany, right on the, down the slope from the Mount of Olives. And that's where he would stay several nights that week as he had periodically whenever he was down um, southern area at the home of Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And so he um, was nearing the village of Bethphage, and he sent two of his disciples uh, ahead, telling them that they would find a donkey and uh, a colt. And so they were instructed to bring him the animals. And then when they had done that, uh, he sat on the young donkey and slowly made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And um, in doing so, he fulfilled one of the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the Messiah that I have printed here from Zechariah 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so they were encountered by a number of people, including children, who welcomed him by waving palm branches and um, shouting Hosanna in the highest, uh, Hosanna to the son of David, which is a me messianic term. Uh, blessed be the name that uh, comes in the name of the Lord. Kind of reminds me of a Palm Sunday. I did a worship service I did back in the um, 80s, a long time ago now, down in Southern California in the San Fernando Valley. I was pastor of a church uh, at the Holy Cross in Granada Hills. And um, we were near the acting community near Hollywood. And so we had a, some actors in our church. And I asked one of them if they had a trained donkey that they could bring to church that Sunday. Uh, a trained donkey means one who relieves himself only on command. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, that was the thing I was worried about. What kind of trail would be down the center aisle? But, 
So we did it. We had the kids come. We had a big group of kids. And uh, matter of fact, we had a, a preschool too. And uh, so we had uh, the kids and a lot of kids from the preschool would come to church. And uh, they came, followed the donkey down the center aisle as a processional mm-hmm. into the church mm-hmm. on that Palm Sunday. Um, I had a few people that were asking if that was appropriate. And I said, well, I don't know. Let's just turn to the Bible and see what Jesus would say. <laughs> oh, we happen to be on one. Well, <laughs> yes, that takes care of that one. Oh and God. so after doing that, then they um, went back to Bethany near Bethany, the house of Lazarus, Mary and Martha. And you remember the story of Lazarus, right? Where Jesus had before gone and raised up Lazarus from the dead after he had been in the uh, burial vault for four days. That in in Hebrew terms is stone cold dead. That means that after three days, the soul is nowhere near the body anymore. And so they believed in their kind of fantasy world that the soul lingered for a while. But by the fourth day, you could smell the the remains and this and that. And so they were not very eager for Jesus to do that, but he did. And he came back alive. And someone says, well, see, there's another resurrection from the dead. And I said, it's not a resurrection. It's a resuscitation because in a resurrection, you have a glorified body and you don't die again. Whereas Lazarus had his regular body and would die again, but he was brought back to life. So it was a miracle. And they were there that evening, and uh, uh, Mary, Martha, and uh, Lazarus probably hosted them. Then on Monday, uh, Jesus goes back uh, with his disciples to Jerusalem. And on the way in, you may remember, he curses a fig tree because it wasn't bearing any fruit. Mm -hmm. And this was supposed to be symbolic spiritually for the unbelievers, especially the unbelieving leaders who, even though they had the word of God, did not bear the fruit of repentance, did not have faith in their heart. So when Jesus arrived at the temple, he found the courts full of corrupt money changers. Now this would be the court of the Gentiles. You have the the court of the Gentiles, and then inwardly you have the court of the, the, the women, and then inwardly most, then the Jewish women, and then you have the Israelites, where, where they would go, and then in closer to the holy place, you'd have the where the sacrifices were, and you'd have the where the priests were, where the animals were kept, and then you enter into the holy place, and then on the back of that is a curtain that goes into the holy of holies, where only the high priest enters once a year. So Jesus was on the outermost court where everybody could go. And it was just a zoo. Mm. People were selling stuff, and it was a mockery out of what uh, worship was supposed to be all about. And so he threw out the money changers. You know the story about that. He says, my temple will be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. And so then that evening, he leaves the temple and goes back and probably to the same home there, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Now, on Tuesday morning, Jesus and his disciples return to Jerusalem, and they go past this fig tree. Now, Jesus had cursed it Monday. Tuesday, the whole fig tree was withered, just withered on the vine. And Jesus spoke to his companions about the importance of faith. Back at the temple, religious leaders were upset at Jesus for having established himself as a spiritual authority. And so they organized an ambush with the idea that they were going to place him under arrest. But Jesus evaded their traps and pronounced harsh judgment on them as religious leaders. And so this is what he said in in Matthew, blind guides, for you're like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones, and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly, you look like righteous people, but inwardly, your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. 
snakes, <laughs> sons of vipers. How will you escape the judgment of hell? Do you think that Jesus at times just kind of spoke the truth out boldly? <laughs> this is one case. Whoa, is he going to get make it out of there that day? Well, he did. And later that afternoon, uh, Jesus went with his disciples to the Mount of Olives. And Mount of Olives sits due east of Jerusalem, overlooking all the city of Jerusalem. And here Jesus gives us um, talk, this prayer, discourse to, to the Father, discourse about the disciples, and, uh, and um, a discourse really about the end of the age uh, and the final judgment. And as usual, he uses symbolic language. And then um, it's also the day when scholars believe Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, negotiated with the senator and the religious Supreme Court um, to betray Jesus. So then, once again, they return back to Bethany that night. Wednesday, nothing in is recorded in the Bible of Wednesday in Holy Week. And um, so we had a busy day on Tuesday. He was very popular on Bethany in that area. So I'm sure that many of the local people saw him that day. Then on Thursday, which we know is the uh, Monday Thursday, Jesus sent from Bethany Peter and John to get prepared the upper room in Jerusalem, get it ready for the um, Passover feast. So that evening after sunset, and remember the days in the Hebrew calendar started at sunset. So Friday at sunset will be the beginning of a new day. And same with every other day. It starts at sunset. Sunset to sunset. And so after sunset on that Thursday, this will be a Jesus washed the feet of his disciples as they prepared to share in the Passover. And by performing that act of humility, he was indicating the kind of love that the disciples needed to have uh, one for the other. And then he made that, that into Holy Communion. He said, um, I've been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So the meaning of the Passover was that, and the reason why they had to celebrate the Passover year after year, even though they would pass over uh, the Red Sea and made it into the wilderness and the Egyptians were after them, is that the final Passover, where the blood is shed for the forgiveness of all the sins, had not yet happened, and it would be occurring on Good Friday. And so to commemorate that, he establishes out of the Passover with one of the cups of wine and the and the matzo's bread, the unleavened bread, uh, something called Holy Communion, the Last Supper, for Christians to partake of frequently, for he is in the body, his body is in the bread, his blood is with the, the cup, and what's in the cup, and that through that they would remember the sacrifice he shed on the cross and that he was going to shed. So later, uh, Jesus and his disciples leave the upper room and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, where, which was next to the Mount of Olives, where Jesus begins to pray in agony, shedding his like sh drops of blood. His, his prayer was so earnest and um, he he was um, asking that this cup could pass from him but not his will but the father's be done so his human nature was saying this is not going to be pretty his divine nature was saying uh, but what has to be has to be 
Father, you tell me what it is and I'll obey you. <clears throat> and so then later that evening, uh, Judas comes up to him and betrays the Savior with a kiss. Yes. It's then that uh, there, he's taken hostage, he's arrested, and so begins the first of six trials, all false, all illegal. The trials weren't to be done at night, they were to be done during the day, they would be done with notice. Mm -hmm. This is all hasty, it's all at night. Three by the uh, Sanhedrin, by the Jewish group, and three by the Romans. And so you continue going, going, going until it's early Friday morning. And so that's what happened that day. And that brings us to Friday morning. Friday morning is the most difficult day of the, of the Passion Week because Jesus' journey is to Jerusalem is over. And um, according to um, Scripture, Judas Iscariot, the disciple who had betrayed Jesus uh, was overcome with remorse and killed himself. And meanwhile, about the third hour, so this would be 9 a.m. on Friday morning, Jesus um, was endured the, the, the false accusations, the condemnation, the beatings, the mockery, all the rest of it. And um, then he was sentenced to death by crucifixion. Uh, and by three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, he had died. His first words on the cross were, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Last words on the cross was, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. But between those two of the seven words on the cross were a couple other very important words. And we could go through those, and I'm sure you have in the past. One was, we didn't call God Father. He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God was not father at that point. He was facing the hell of the father's abandonment, mm -hmm. the eternity in hell for every sin of every person who would ever live on planet Earth. And that's what he faced. That's what was so horrendous about the crucifixion. It wasn't just another person dying. He was facing eternal death, all telescoped into a few hours on the cross. And then uh, he, right before he said, it is finished. Uh, I mean, to my hands, I commit my spirit. He says, it is finished, which is the word in Greek, to tell us I, which um, means it is paid in full. Everything that was required, I have done. Uh, I am now done with my state of humiliation and I will give up my spirit to my father. With that, he dies. They take him down. It was nearing sunset, which means it was nearing the Sabbath. So they had to hastily remove Jesus from the cross. They saw he was already dead, so they didn't break his bones. Another fulfillment of scriptural prophecy that not a bone was broken. And they... Uh, Joseph of Arimathea, who was part of the elite, the, and um, Nicodemus, part of the Sanhedrin, both offered to help with the burial. Joseph of Arimathea had a, a burial vault, a cave where no one had been laid yet. He offered that for this purpose. Nicodemus had about 75 pounds of, bought 75 pounds of, uh, of, uh, Appointment to put on Jesus. They wrapped him up hastily. They put him into the grave. Uh, and then the Roman officials made sure nobody could get near that grave, lest someone say that he was he rose. And so they sealed the grave entrance with a huge a rock, a huge boulder. Then they sealed it and they put guards in front of it so that no, no one could have access to it. And that's where it was between a Friday night and Sunday morning. Friday one day, Saturday one day, Sunday one Can you day. Try again? Three days, according to Jewish ways of counting. 
Then comes Easter then morning. Comes Easter morning. So Saturday in the tomb, I might say Saturday in the tomb, uh, somewhere between Friday night and, and Saturday, Sunday morning, Jesus descends into hell. In other words, he goes to the, to the place where Satan and his demons exist, uh, where, where the evil spirits even of the, uh, that were at the time of Noah existed. And he proclaims to them, not more suffering, he proclaims to them that he has won the victory. Now you remember we have talked about how the some of the angels in heaven uh, sinned and were, were taken out of heaven, including Satan, and they came to earth as they the, this interim place until Judgment Day, and they would um, confer with the Father whether somebody is good enough to be in heaven or not, and this and that. And this kind of judgment, this kind of uh, interference went away at the time of the crucifixion. Uh, the Satan has no place uh, to condemn anyone who is God's child. There is no condemnation now for those who are in Christ Jesus, the Bible now tells us. And so he goes down there and he proclaims his victory over Satan and all of his wily foes. And then he will be soon coming back to throw them into the mm -hmm. lake of fire and the final judgment. And that he has, uh, has overcome sin and death. And that made possible for him to become the prince of the earth and not Satan. So with that then comes Easter morning. And early in that morning, several women, um, including Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Salome, and Mary, the mother of James, go to the tomb and discover, and especially Mary Magdalene is, is pictured in the book of John, the large stone covering the entrance had been rolled away. And the, the angel announced, don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. And so from then on, Jesus began to show himself more and more over a period of 40, 40, 40 days to the disciples uh, without Thomas, disciples with Thomas, um, disciples going on the road to, the, to Emmaus, he appeared to Peter, uh, to James, to uh, several hundred at once, many, many people, so that the Jerusalem church after Pentecost really began to grow and um, grow so much that 2,000 years after his resurrection, 2.3 billion people are now Christian. As I'm going to mention on Easter Sunday, that's more people than live in China or Europe or the United States combined. Mm -hmm. Nothing like this has ever happened. And that gives us a, a little inkling into uh, Holy Week. With this, I'd like to open it up for observations, questions. Pretty exciting. It really is. Big week. <clears throat> which day, which day other than Easter? grabs your attention. <clears throat> well, he rises on Easter Sunday, but my attention is that what he did on Good Friday. Good Friday, absolutely. That's the day death died. Yeah. Hell. 
Any other thoughts? Can, can you um, explain a little bit what happens when Jesus went into hell? Is there any accounting of, it says he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave. But is there any description of like what that was like when he went to hell? Any description of what it was like what? When Jesus descended into hell. I know he confronted Satan and he took the um, key, but is there it, any description or any contempt? I don't think the Bible's really um, spells well, that. It's mentioned in Second Peter and in the book of Jude. Mm -hmm. And it's um, alluded to it at one place and mentioned the other. You have to remember that the divine drama had three points where man fell into sin, people fell into sin in Genesis 3, and, and then the Nephilim came and there was the flood in Genesis 6, and there was a scattering of the nations, and they were given over to idols in chapter 11 of Genesis, and God then chose a new nation out of Abram, then to be the light of the Gentiles in chapter 11, and that carried through the Old Testament. Meanwhile, these, these demonic spirits seem to be taking over everywhere. And to counter that, Jesus knew he had to become the new Israel himself. He needed to do what Israel was supposed to do. He needed to go to all the nations and proclaim that he had won the victory and all nations can call on him as, as their God. And so... First and foremost, because they're fight, he was fighting not only a physical war warfare, but he was fighting spiritual warfare with the demons and the spiritual powers. He went to the spiritual powers first and proclaimed his victory to that realm, the unseen realm. Then on Easter, he came back and proclaimed his victory to the seen realm, to, to the human realm. So that now heaven is cleansed of all those angels and, and all the demons' powers is taken away. And all people on earth can likewise be restored as, as uh, children of the Heavenly Father if they believe in what Jesus has done as the way, the truth, and the life. So, so this is what he's proclaiming to them in that realm. And then on Easter, he's proclaiming also to, to the world. The Father's really saying, it took what happened on Good Friday is validated because he's risen from the dead. If he hadn't been, if he hadn't risen from the dead, then you'd have another Confucius or another Muhammad or somebody. But he rose from the dead, so he's singular. He's unique. Christianity is unique in that way, in that he proved himself to be who he said he was. Any other thoughts, questions? Good. Good comments, Wendy. Thank you. That's also really neat that you said that um, he always addressed him as father. And then he said, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was, I never noticed that before. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Can you only imagine what that'd be like to have the full wrath and fury of almighty God, the father upon oneself? And I don't, we don't understand this, how God can do this to God. Well, in the Old Testament, there was always the God and there was the name of God or the angel of God. And we know the pre-incarnate Christ was there in the Old Testament too. So we see at least two of the three persons of the Trinity, even in the Old Testament. But So you, you have these creeds that have been developed, including one that we hardly ever know about, the Athanasian Creed. It's about two and a half pages long. Dale, do you remember the old Lutheran hymnal that had that in it? Maybe on Trinity Sunday, some of you remember saying it. Any of you? Oh, yeah. I read. <laughs> the old church, the old pastor, got, now we're going to say the Athanasian Creed. It took about 10 minutes, and no one could understand a word of it. But it was um, confounded and comprehended, and, you know, but it all had this technical theological language where there are three people, three persona. But it's one God, just like a tree can have a trunk, can have roots, can have branches, not three trees, it's one tree, three aspects of the one 
And yet the Holy Spirit is not the Son. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. They're, they each have a role to play. No one can understand it, but it's the truth. We got rid of those pastors that used to make us say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, so that's tonight. We're just talking a little bit about Holy Week. Now, next week, being Holy Week, we won't meet on Wednesday. We'll meet on Thursday evening for a little devotional Monday. time on Monday, Thursday. I don't know how I'm going to give you Holy Communion this way, but I want to tell you a secret. I did exactly that at Emmanuel. And because we were in uh, no church for the longest time. And uh, we would uh, have people get their own bread and their own wine, and we would uh, have a virtual Holy Communion. I don't, I know some controversy about that in Senate, but uh, um, I, I said, well, if you get on the phone and you pray with somebody, you're not physically with that person. Is that still a prayer? Of course. Is that a real prayer or is that a fake prayer? That's a real prayer. So if you have Holy Communion, you're, you're with one another, but you're not physically in the same room. Can you still say you're communing together? And we <laughs> said it. We believe God would understand under these circumstances. So that's what we did for a while. And then um, I was good when we got back together again. I still remember when I was at uh, Trinity, uh, the first week or two, uh, was just we were just coming. I don't like to say the phrase coming out, <laughs> but we were just uh, coming back to worship. Remember that? That was a, a year and some months ago now. And uh, everybody ha had their mask on and Doors open, fans going, everybody sitting five five thousand yards from me, everybody else. Remember that? <laughs> and uh and gradually we began to do it and gradually had communion. And by April or so, by Easter, a year ago, we we're feeling a little bit comfortable. And hard I mean, people don't even re quite re even remember yeah. that a year and a half ago we weren't even worshiping together physically. Yeah, I entered into that scene, right? I didn't, for the first few weeks, it was about six weeks, I didn't see anybody's face. Remember, mm -hmm. everybody had a mask on. <laughs> I, saw a mask. I saw your glasses, nice glasses, or whatever it was you're wearing. And um, that's about it. And yeah, still a couple people I don't see. They weren't, they, they, they need to wear the mask, but uh, at least most of them, I know what they look like now. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording after a word of prayer, and then if you want to talk, we can. Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to go over again the clear scriptural teaching of your suffering and your death and your resurrection. May it prompt us to be joyful always and to live with hope no matter what's happening in our life. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.